Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 27th of March, 2024, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me today, uh, Vanessa Bealey and Charles Mallet. Uh, we're going to get started with Assange. Uh, and of course, the High Court, sorry, the high court hearing was yesterday. Uh, and uh, the two judges decided that they would adjourn uh, their final judgment until the 20th of May while they went back to the United States looking for assurances. Uh, they were looking for assurances that Assange would uh, maintain his uh, First Amendment freedom of speech rights while he was in the US, that he wouldn't be subject to the death penalty uh, and uh, and so on. So uh, really this uh, looks like the situation that he, uh, they are minded to send him back or send him to the United States, extradite him as the US has asked. Uh, here is uh, a comment from Shield Maiden uh, I was saying uh, the British courts have pretty much just given the US administration practically a free pass. And a quote from Stella Assange saying, Julian is a political prisoner. He's a journalist and he's being persecuted because he exposed the true cost of war and human lives. Uh, this case is a retribution. It's a signal to all of you that if you expose the interests that are driving war, they will come after you. They will put you in prison and try to kill you. Uh, so, uh, Vanessa, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this, but uh, it it looks uh, like, uh, it, assuming the United States says what the High Court wants it to say, uh, on the 20th of May, they will refuse the right to, to appeal and uh, then the extradition will take another step forward. But, I mean, we can't believe anything the United States is going to say in this case anyway, can we? No, and according to a report that I read by Craig Murray, who was in the court, of course, um, they basically changed the charges completely uh, and then didn't allow the defence lawyers to present new witnesses or to have any time to consider the new charges. So this just seems to be a completely trumped up manoeuvre to keep Assange incarcerated for as long as possible in the UK and two, to make it impossible to defend the new charges, presumably. Yeah, well, I mean, they have been kicking the can down the road uh, mm. as much as they possibly can. I'm not sure how much further uh, they could kick it down the road. Uh, Charles, have you got any thoughts on, on this uh, topic? Well, I think those, uh, those words of Stella Assange's are, are absolutely right on the money. And I mean, obviously, Julian Assange's case, rightly, is the most high profile of this. But there are plenty of other examples, not just here, but across the world, where spreading the word of truth, shall we say, is, is smashed down upon in, you know, ironically, hardest by those countries that, that tell the rest of the world that they are liberal democracies. Uh, indeed, absolutely. So uh, we will uh, report, obviously, on this as uh, time goes on. But the next date for your diaries is the uh, 20th of May, it looks like. Uh, now, uh, Vanessa, let me welcome you properly to the programme and uh, head over to Moscow and uh, the uh, terrorist attack, uh, or is it a terrorist attack uh, that happened there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a terrorist attack. Who was behind that terrorist attack is still not completely um, concluded. Although uh, the head of the FSB put out a statement, I believe, uh, Alex uh, Bortnikov, in the last 24 hours, that Moscow now believes, or the FSB believes, that uh, US, UK and Ukraine are behind the Moscow attack. They don't mention Turkey, which is interesting, because apparently the terrorists were actually trained in Turkey. Um, now, this was a statement put out by the US and the UK embassies in Russia on, I think it was the 7th of March, warning uh, British citizens, US citizens, to avoid large gatherings over the next 48 hours um, and to include, obviously, crowded places, etc. But strange that they put in the wording to include concerts. Now, why is this strange? A lot of people have highlighted this on social media. But um, basically, at the same time, there was this report in Forbes, the U.S. embassy warns of imminent extremist attack in Moscow. And this was apparently based on an FSB foiling um, of an extremist attack against a Jewish uh, synagogue in Moscow. The report is up on the FSB website. So you can translate it into English. But interesting that the FSB report which talks about preventing a terrorist act during which the terrorists were actually eliminated, did not mention any danger to concerts or even um, to crowded places. 
And then um, if we remember that there was uh, the, the Russian security forces have mentioned that the original attack should have taken place, in their opinion, on the 8th of March, that so that would tie in with the US-UK warning. But again, how do they know that it was going to be an attack on a, on a concert? And that attack was delayed because uh, the oligarch that owns the concert hall turned up to see a concert by a Russian patriotic singer called Shaman. And he was surrounded by bodyguards. And in theory, the terrorists pulled back because it was clearly too dangerous for them to carry out the attack at that time. Now, let's see John Kirby after the Crocus attack, what he said. I'm not aware of any advanced knowledge that we had uh, of this, this, this on, terrible attack. On March 8th, uh, the embassy warns of imminent attack in Moscow by extremists. Yeah, I, I think that I'll let the State Department speak to that, I think, but I don't think that was related to this specific attack. Well, I mean, if they had information of any kind, why wasn't it passed on through official channels um, to the Russian security forces? Right. So that is a question that has to be asked. And why was he so quick to deny that they had any foreknowledge when they clearly did on March the 8th? Then, of course, uh, other contexts, the NATO ally could command a 60,000 strong force in Ukraine. So this is the French leading the charge with a number of other countries um, going along with this uh, to uh, basically put NATO troops on the ground. Um, so a handful of NATO nations discussing sending allied forces into Ukraine in training and advisory roles, though not as combat troops, allegedly. The Baltic states of Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia and Poland have expressed support of Paris's position, although the US and Germany are opposed. So that is another um, context prior to the attack on the Crocus. And then here we go. Barack Obama drops in for a cuppa with UK Rishi Sunak. What do they discuss for an hour when Obama is sitting with his cuppa with Rishi Sunak? Um, he was allegedly in town for a meeting of the Obama Foundation. Um, and Downing Street later said that the pair spoke for an, around a, an hour sorry, over cups of tea. They discussed a range of subjects, including artificial intelligence. Well, they could also have discussed many other intelligence issues. Um, and then we have uh, Vicky Cookies Newland, who put out this statement about two weeks before she actually resigned her position, where she mentions uh, the upcoming asymmetric warfare against Russia. So let's roll that video. With the $60 billion supplemental that the administration has requested of Congress, we can ensure that Ukraine not only survives, but she thrives. With this support, in 2024, we can help ensure Ukraine can continue to fight, to build, to recover, and to reform. With this money, Ukraine will be able to fight back in the East, but it will also be able to accelerate the asymmetric warfare that has been most effective on the battlefield. And as I said in Kyiv three weeks ago, this supplemental funding will ensure Putin faces some nasty surprises on the battlefield this year. I mean, interesting wording there. Um, also, uh, immediately after the attack, of course, Alexei Danilov, who was the head of um, a Security and Defense Council in Kiev, put out an extraordinary statement mocking the Russians after the attack and stating maybe we should visit you more often, which is, is an implied threat. Um, it came also, the attack came immediately after, so I think it was the same night, that uh, Russia and China had vetoed the US-led UN resolution on the East Gaza ceasefire, which of course, uh, basically the US-led uh, resolution was demanding the surrender of Hamas in order to achieve a ceasefire that was vetoed by Russia and China, and the attack came on the same night. Um, and then just a, a sort of a bit of a kickback to the 20th of October last year, when we showed a video interview with Amir Whiteman, the founder of the Likud party, one of the most far-right extremist parties um, in Israel. Uh, and let's hear what he said back then. 
war. We're going to win because we're stronger. After this, Russia will pay the price. Believe me, Russia will, Russia pay, will pay the, the price. price. Russia is supporting the enemies of Israel. Russia is supporting Nazi people who want to commit genocide on us. And just Russia will pay the price. Russia also. Now, let me listen to me very carefully. We are going to finish with these Nazis. We're going to win this war. It's going to take the time it's going to go take, but we're going to win this war. Afterwards, we're not forgetting what you are doing. We're not forgetting. We will come. We will make sure that Ukraine wins. We will make sure that you pay the price for what you have done. You as Russia and you and as all the enemies of Israel and you as all the people who are now making everything they can to support genocide of the Jews in Israel. We are not forgetting. We are not forgetting. Remember exactly what I'm saying now. You will pay the price. Again, interesting uh, declaration there. And then this is going back to 2019, but actually you can find reports from as far back as 2014, how Ukraine became the unlikely home for ISIS leaders escaping the caliphate. So basically ISIS terrorists that were um, let's say, incubated in Iraq, emerged from al-Qaeda, created by President Obama, funded and equipped by under Obama's administration inside Syria, um, fled to Ukraine, where, in my view, they were again incubated and, um, let's say, adopted by the CIA, because here they talk about the fact um, that the ones that made it to Ukraine are the dangerous ones, because once they get to Turkey, it's a fairly difficult route to get into Ukraine. Um, and it then talks about the fact that uh, this particular guy, uh, Al-Bara Shishani, it's not the original Shishani leader of the original ISIS. This was another guy from Georgia also, also so another Chechen. There are a large amount of Chechen ISIS fighters inside Ukraine right now. Um, he was picked up by the SBU and the CIA. And it mentions in the report, it's unclear why they chose not to arrest him earlier. Now, we know that the, the CIA has a hand in, in the recruiting um, and, and the training of many of these ISIS members. Now, I would say that although the attack has been claimed immediately by the UK and the US with very little time to make that conclusion, the attack was carried out by ISIS. These were not... Um, Ideology-wise, these were not ISIS fighters. ISIS fighters would not allow themselves uh, to be captured. They would die fighting because martyrdom is a major ethos um, of the ISIS organization. So I don't think these were pure ISIS. I think they were mercenaries. Now, where were they recruited from? We know that they were picked up uh, in Tajikistan. Of course, what does this do? Create um, racial divisions potentially in Russia. That could be another cause and effect of, of the attack itself. Um, but this is another interesting piece of information that I have confirmed here in Syria. This was taken from a Russian telegram channel. A few weeks before Krokus, a delegation of Ukrainian officers arrived at the Al Shaddadi base in the Syrian countryside of Al Hasika aboard an American cargo plane sorry, in the northeast of Syria, so where uh, US is occupying uh, with the Kurdish Contra proxies. The Ukrainian delegation held several meetings with American officers at the base and meetings with Kurdish SDF leaders. The media of the SDF didn't officially announce the visit. Coordination between Ukraine and armed groups in Syria is carried out under the direct control of the US. Ukrainian intelligence previously maintained contact with Turkmen leaders in Idlib to conduct military operations against Russian forces on Syrian territory. Now, I have, as I said, confirmed this with numerous sources here. So what is Ukraine and the U.S. trying to do? Are they trying to extend the war across borders, so combine the war in Ukraine and the war in Syria? Or are they trying to recruit more ISIS uh, fighters from Syria to bring to Ukraine to make up for the meat grinder that they're putting their own conscripts into? Yeah, good questions. OK, well, we'll talk about a little bit more about this in Extra No Doubt. Now, uh, Charles, uh, I think it was last week uh, I was covering the fact that uh, the first batch of 10 uh, pilots allegedly to go into F-16s at some point in the future had received their basic training from the RAF and that they were heading off to France. Uh, you have an update on this? I do, Mike. And uh, I should have said earlier, good afternoon, all. 
Yes, you covered it on Friday in brief. And in military parlance, all actions are committed to having an effect. And so I thought I'd look a bit further into the potential effects of this. But exactly as you say, the government have given a press release saying that they've put 10 pilots, Ukrainian pilots, through a basic training program with the RAF. Now, what does that mean? They've gone on and said that they've received basic flying, ground school and language training in the UK and will one day form the first line of defence in protecting Ukraine's skies. Uh, and specifically, they say they're going to go on to France now before learning to fly F-16 fighter jets. So, um, whilst that seems slightly confusing for the pilots concerned, I thought I'd just hark back to the Royal United Services Institute last year, an article published by uh, Professor Justin Bronk. Um, admittedly, this is about typhoons, but the point he's making is the applicability of fast jets to that environment, and specifically referring to such a deployment. The former task is extremely challenging due to the fact that Russia deploys a highly effective and multi-layered ground-based air defence system in Ukraine. Long-range surface air-to-air, sorry, surface-to-air missile systems uh, like the infamous S-400 and the S-300V4, supported by long-range radars like the Podlet, can threaten fighter aircraft at distances of well over 100 kilometres behind the front lines, even at low altitudes. So to reinforce the point put forward by Rusi, which seems to have been completely forgotten, and in effect to contextualise what this means, I spoke to Tim Davis, who is a veteran of both the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force, having flown fast jets for them over a 20-year period, and trained and worked as an electronic warfare officer. So we'll just have a have a listen to a clip of him speaking to me yesterday. Uh, someone coming through this airplane here in the Royal Air Force is probably taking about, if we do it properly, it should take three and a half years. It's never been done. Even when I went through, I took about four, four and a bit. Now it's about seven because of the holes they've got to do in between because we just you know, backlogged on courses. The Ukrainians wouldn't be any different. And of course, British pilots don't have that language problem that Ukrainians have. And it is a language problem still. I've trained Qataris, Saudis, I've trained Indian pilots, I've trained all sorts. Language is a huge issue when you get into a cockpit like this, which is loud, it's hot, is there's a lot of vibration. You, you need to be able to hear what's going on, understand the language. So we've got to put someone, even when they finish on this course here, they're still going to go on to this aircraft here, like the Tornado, which we don't fly anymore, so Typhoon F-35, that's going to take you a year, possibly six months to a year, to train up on that. And then you're not combat ready, you're limited combat ready. No one's going to throw you into a fight, you're going to get killed. So we still need to train you up. We still need another six months, maybe even more than that, where you then progress through onto different leadership aspects, where then you can be taken into some kind of combat zone. So it's not as if, we, we know, the reason F-16s aren't in theatre is they're going to get shot down. Full stop. There's no two ways about it. I was an electronic warfare instructor, so I'm very familiar with the surface to air missile strategies that the Russians use. Uh, I don't speak out of turn about it, of course, but you could read about it on any kind of decent website now. They are they are masters at ground-based air defense. That's why we don't have the permissive air environment over there. We'd, we You see the Ukraine aircraft flying at treetop height. Of course they are. If they flew any higher, they're going to get shot down. This is why we have um, Royal Air Force aircraft over the Black Sea targeting into Ukraine and telling the Russians, sorry, telling the Ukrainians where everything is, where all the Russian stuff is. We have that there because they can't be over Ukraine. The RF cannot be over you. They'd be shot down. They're almost shot down over the Black Sea, remember, weren't they, in the, in the aircraft they were using there? So Tim Davis putting a point of view forward that you won't hear coming out of the government, uh, nor in any of the echo chambers surrounding the government. But the other thing, going back to sort of military parlance and considerations, are the, the, or rather is the question, what if? At every stage of a planning process, you ask, what if? What if such and such a thing happens? So my question is, what if there is a threat from Russia or from anywhere else? Why would the United Kingdom be committing their resources to the training of pilots that are not British at a time like this? It makes no sense at all. 
Uh, very good question. Uh, of course, Russia not the only uh, target of uh, the uh, propaganda from the UK, China increasingly as well. So uh, let's bring this on screen uh, because uh, the issue now is that uh, we've been on the receiving end, allegedly, of Chinese state-backed cyber attacks. Uh, now, we've got a little bit of clip of uh, the wonderful Foreign Secretary David Cameron uh, giving a short briefing on this. Attacks on our democracy are unacceptable, yet that is what organisations backed by China have done. Today, we are publicly calling them out, and we've taken action. We've summoned the Chinese ambassador, and we are putting sanctions, travel bans, asset freezes, on the individuals and the group responsible. Such action from China will not be tolerated. We will always seek to defend ourselves from those that threaten our values and our democracy and we encourage other countries to do the same. So there you go, the wonderful David Cameron. Uh, now, his words, of course, weren't his own. Uh, they came from information from the uh, National Cyber Security Centre, part of GCHQ. So let's have a look and see what they said here. Uh, they said, GCHQ's National Cyber Security Centre assesses China's state-affiliated actor APT31 was most certainly responsible for targeting UK parliamentarians' emails in 2021. Now, APT31 stands for Advanced Persistent Threat Group 31. It's got a number of other names, as we will see on uh, this graphic from the US Department of State. Uh, so these ha hackers, they say, have helped China's Ministry of State Security Conduct conduct malicious cyber operations against US critical infrastructure through its front company, uh, Wuhan XRZ. It, Wuhan must be at a, the most amazing place in China because not only do they release bioweapons on the world, uh, and neither it's, it's a center of cyber attacks as well. It's quite amazing. Uh, so anyway, they are these uh, seven people on screen are, are part of a Chinese state-sponsored intelligence officers, a group of uh, Chinese state-sponsored intelligence officers and co contract hackers known in the cybersecurity community as App31 otherwise known as Zirconium, Violet Typhoon, Judgment Panda, and Altair. Um, so uh, that's what they look like. Uh, the N NCSC uh, report went on to say, uh, to bring in the whole electoral process, because we've got to know that no matter what the outcome of the election uh, this year, it's going to be interfered with by external uh, bodies, and China is going to be a key one. So the compromise of the UK electoral commission systems has also been attributed to a China state-affiliated actor in a separate instance of malicious activity, they said. And as a result of this, uh, they have updated their advice to anybody taking part uh, in the uh, uh, coming elections. So they've provided an extra page in their on their Defending Democracy uh, page, uh, Guidance for Political Organizations. So go and have a look at that if you want to see what they're talking about. But let's have a look at a quote from Paul Chichester, who is... Uh, uh, the NSC, NCSC Director of Operations saying that the malicious activities we've exposed today are, are indicative of a wider pattern of unacceptable behaviour we're seeing from China's state-affiliated actors against the UK and around the world. Uh, the targeting of our democratic system is unacceptable and the NCSC will continue to call out cyber actors who pose a threat to the institutions and values that underpin our society. Uh, and uh, then going back to the report, uh, it says that the cyber campaign against the parliamentary email accounts of members across both houses of parliament was identified and successfully mitigated by parliament's security department before any accounts could be compromised. Well, I find that very interesting because they, the parliament's uh, security department seemed to be able to mitigate the Chinese activity, but they weren't able to mitigate the British activity. So let's just remind ourselves of Big Brother Watch's uh, Ministry of Truth Exposed report. Uh, we had covered some of this in the past, but let's just remind ourselves what this said. Uh, Secret of Whitehall units have been monitoring government critics' speech online, including MPs, academics, journalists, human rights campaigners, and the public under the guise of combating disinformation. Uh, our report, that's Big Brother Watch's report, Ministry of Truth, the Secret of Government units spying on your speech, revealed for the first time the truth behind the government's five anti-fake news units and how their mission of countering disinformation quickly turned to countering dissent across the UK. Now, I would dispute the first time bit because uh, we'll bring the graphic that we produced back on screen in a minute, but let's just remind ourselves what they went on to say. They pointed out that Caroline Lucas, a Green Party MP, was included in an election disinformation report for calling the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson a liar. 
Uh, they said that Labour leaders Sir Keir Starmer, Conservative MPs David Davis and Chris Green, high-profile academics from the University of Oxford and University College London, and journalists including Peter Hitchens and Julia Hartley Brewer, all had comments critical of the government analysed by anti-misinformation units within the government. Uh, and that soldiers from the Army's 77th Brigade tasked with non-lethal psychological warfare collected tweets from British citizens posting about COVID-19 and passed them to central government despite claiming operations were directed strictly overseas. So let's just bring on uh, the UK column graphic, which demonstrates the scale. And this is fra frankly a fraction of what is there uh, of the government censorship network. This is the, the key point. This is the level of surveillance that's going on, not just of the citizenry or the public in the United Kingdom, but also of MPs, of uh, activists, of anybody that's uh, pursuing a, a, a different narrative to the government or attempting to hold the government to account in any way. Uh, and with respect to the issue of 77 Brigade and its behaviour, um, I put in a Freedom of Information request to the Ministry of Defence uh, on this in January, uh, because if you remember... As we reported at the time, uh, Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, had uh, got up in Parliament and said that he had instructed uh, that not only uh, that the the government not only looks into the story of the surveillance of the MPs and so on, uh, but checks that the instructions that he had issued to 77 Brigade about how they were supposed to behave uh, were carried out. Uh, so I was asking for the documentation around these instructions. Um, now, not only has the Ministry of Defence, they're not even bothering to reply at this point. So at least the Foreign Office stalls and obfuscates and tries to refuse to answer freedom of information requests. The Ministry of Defence on this issue uh, is absolutely in breach of the law because they are not even responding uh, or acknowledging receipt of the freedom of information request from me at this point. It's quite uh, impressive how they seem to be uh, quite happy to ignore the law in this case. Uh, now, moving from China, just for a second, we'll come back to China in a minute, and to looking at Russia, uh, the BBC was carrying this article earlier, uh, Kit Rumours uh, Linked to Russian Disinformation. And this is uh, all about the furore over uh, uh, the Princess of Wales. Uh, and uh, the BBC in this report saying, security researchers believe a Russian-based disinformation group amplified and added to the frenzy of social media conspiracies about the Princess of, Prince of Wales' health. Uh, researchers found many new accounts on Twitter and other platforms sharing identically worded messages. But hold on a second. Just as uh, it's the UK that are doing the majority of the surveillance on U the UK public and on MPs and so on, and not China, it's the UK and others are Western-backed uh, interests that are doing most of this behaviour on Twitter. So let's remind ourselves about NAFO, for example, who behave in exactly this way. Uh, we should also mention the Mutton Crew as well, who seem to behave in this way. And of course, we should remind ourselves that Integrity Initiative was a British exercise in order to uh, build a nar an anti-Russian, uh, a Russophobic narrative. Uh, doesn't end with uh, Integrity Inif Initiative, which is a private organisation within uh, Parliament itself. The Intelligence and Security uh, Committee of Parliament published their Russia report absolutely to build up a Russophob Russophobic narrative. And the same committee uh, published their China report in order to build exactly the same type of narrative. Um, so I'm going to say at this point, this is these are my words, Russia and China are no threat to the British people. The real threat to the British people is the British government, the media industrial complex, and the NGO slash CSO industrial complex. And just to highlight that last point for uh, to begin with, uh, you know, what do we have in terms of so soft power projection from China? We have the Confucius Institute on one hand. And what does the West have? We have all these uh, foundations, all these tax exempt foundations that are operating both domestically and abroad. And this is just a fraction of the tax exempt foundations that push uh, certain types of policy agendas uh, in the West. Uh, and then coming back to my comment from a second ago, if we just highlight the British government uh, part, the real threat to the British people is the British government. Let me just remind everybody of the uh, integrated operating concept. Uh, go and look for this document and read it. I'm just going to take uh, one particular quote from it. Uh, the old distinction between foreign and domestic defence is increasingly irrelevant. Home is no longer a secure sanctuary, whence we may choose to launch interventions unhindered. Away is no longer a regional horizon, but a global one. Similarly, the front 
it no longer lies in some distant theater operations of operations, but is within the port airfield or barracks. Uh, Charles, the British government and the their poodles in the uh, British mainstream media and the various NGOs and CSOs uh, that are assisting the British government, none of these organizations hold the British government to account. The level of surveillance uh, on the UK public and even on MPs by the British government and its intelligence agencies um, vastly outstrips any behavior by Russia or China. So therefore, I'm, my feeling on this is they are our enemy perhaps, but certainly we, we should be holding them to account first before we st start looking abroad. I quite agree. It's, a, it's an enormous distraction or, de or deflection. And um, just thinking about the text there from 77 Brigade talking about non-lethal psychological warfare, people might be wondering what, what lethal psychological warfare could be. And I would say that would be the creation of the state of emergency around a fabricated pandemic, which caused people to behave in such a way that lives were unquestionably lost, particularly among the elderly community who were dealt with in an absolutely appalling fashion by people who, um, for the most part, panicked, of course, egged on by exactly those that Mike describes. Um, so yes, I mean, that, that's, that's very sinister. Then, then, you know, a lot of it's in plain sight. I reported last year on the activities of His Majesty's Government Communications Centre, the HMGCC, which is developing openly with the private sector, um, a device to effectively clone SIM cards in order, it says, to be able to safely track its own employees. But I don't think it takes much of a mental leap to consider it could have other applications. So this continues all the time. Um, on sanctions, uh, David Cameron, I mean, it's, it's frankly just waffle. Uh, we spoke last week about the effect that sanctions have not had on Russia. So talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. I mean, he's got to decide really What's the what's the goal of that? Who's it going to hurt more, China or the United Kingdom, or at least the people who are paying his salary in the United Kingdom, specifically? So I mean, it, you know, this is a mindful. I'm sure we could go on talking about it for for a long time, but no, I mean, I I absolutely agree with you, Mike. I really do. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit more about this in extra as well. Okay. Uh, if you like what the UK column does, you would like to support us. Uh, the options to help us are on support.ukcolumn.org. All the options are there. Uh, please do uh, have a look at that if you possibly can, because we can only do what we're doing with that support. Uh, you could pick something up at the UK Column shop, uh, but please do share anything you find on the various platforms, especially ukcolumn.org and ukcolumnextracts.co.uk. Uh, now, uh, Charles already mentioned his uh, interview with uh, Morgan Lorette. Uh, that is, uh, or maybe actually, maybe he mentioned that during the uh, during the pre-show discussion that we were all having. So, uh, Charles, just br very briefly, give everybody a, a, an overview of this. Thanks, Mike. Yes, uh, Morgan Lorette served as uh, for initially as an airman in Iraq in the early two thousands. He then went into Blackwater at the height of its activities in Baghdad uh, as a private military contractor about which he's written a very, very entertaining and philosophical book called Guns, Girls and Greed. And I spoke to him for an hour. He was very candid, very humorous, and he has a lot of very profound thoughts on the nature and conduct of warfare. Thank you for that. So have a look at that if you possibly can. Uh, tomorrow at 1pm, uh, the third part of The Green King uh, this is No Smoke Without Fires series with Brian and Debbie, but this is the third part uh, looking at the Green King, King which is, of course, of course, King Charles. Uh, do have a look at that 1pm uh, if you possibly can tomorrow. Uh, and Debbie, uh, Debbie's blog is up uh, if anybody would have a look at that more on the MHRA and the MHRA board meeting uh, and so on. So uh, do have a look at that if you can. And finally, just a very quick reminder that uh, we are taking an Easter break uh, this uh, weekend, so there'll be no UK column news on Friday or on Monday. Uh, we will see you at uh, 1 p.m. on Tuesday for the interview that goes out then, uh, and then the next news program will be on Wednesday next week. Um, okay, uh, where does that take us? Uh, bird flu, Charles. Back, back to bird flu, indeed. The the spectre of yet another 
terrifying disease looms over us. And UK Column has been reporting on this for some time, prompted now by the announcement last week that the government is introducing new measures to combat bird flu, in, but essentially to uh, invite or rather order everybody that keeps poultry to register their birds. Now, before you tune out because you don't keep poultry, I would put it to you that this has absolutely nothing to do with poultry, nothing to do with health, everything to do with fear, control, surveillance and compliance, as well as big pharma. So you see here, the information on the register will also be used to identify all bird keepers in disease control zones, allowing for more effective surveillance. Of course, they're putting it forward as though it's um, efficiency. Now, this has come from a recommendation from a 2018 document put together by Dame Glenis Stacey. Uh, here, here it is, the Farm Inspection and Regulation Review, and the most standout sentence from her forward is here, which exemplifies the lack of trust that our government has for its populace. Regulation is really all about getting people to act in ways they would not otherwise choose for the best. So this sets the tone for the way in which people are to be treated with regard to the keeping of poultry, although, as I say, this is actually not really the, the subject matter of it. We'll go back and have a look to see how this has come about, because, of course, the government did run a consultation last year in 2023, and they produced or published a summary of responses to go alongside the announcement of the new measures. The options, if you're unable to see the screen, were baseline, which is to do nothing. In effect, the situation at the moment is that if you have 50 birds or fewer, you don't have to register them. And uh, that was the baseline. Therefore, you could opt to uh, keep the status quo or option one, the government's preferred option, which is to extend the requirement in order that everybody who keeps any birds at all should not only register, but have to provide a mandatory annual update or option two to, for the keepers of 10 birds or more, or you don't have a preferred option. Now, it will probably not surprise you to learn that the overwhelming majority, 75% of the 300, sorry, 3,419 respondents said that they did not want any change to the status quo. And option one, the preferred option by government, which is effectively to surveil everybody all the time, was only selected by 13% of people. And to anybody who's ever signed a government petition, you will know, therefore, that the government have gone ahead and done it anyway. Now, where's this come from? The chief vet at the moment is a lady called Christine Middlemiss. She's been in post since 2018. But what I want to draw your attention to is her work in New South Wales, Australia, which is where she was before, and specifically the introduction of risk-based biosecurity legislation and risk-based disease control approaches, the New South Wales Biosecurity Act, which came out in 2015, was effectively implemented under her, um, under her tenure in Australia. We'll look at a video of that in extra to see exactly where it comes from. But what they're doing here is pushing the narrative to capture effectively everything. So they say here the change to bird registration is required in order to protect the health of poultry and other captive birds and also public health. But of course, that's just stated without qualification. Now, the reason for that is what they want you to believe is that bird flu is not only present, but also can be caught by things other than birds and maybe humans. Now, that's why I make the reference specifically to this being relevant to all of us. So, Let's just have an examination of the, the, the sort of biosecurity background to it. This is from November 2021, the what's called the latest situation in which they say that it's in no way connected to the COVID pandemic, which is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus and not carried in poultry. Now, my contention is that this is exactly like the COVID pandemic in that it's entirely fabricated, overstated, and without any kind of scientific background whatsoever. The reason I'm able to say that is because we first of all look at the situation on the ground, updated on the 21st of March. Now, the according to the APHA, the uh, Plant Health um, uh, Agency, there are at any one time in the UK approximately 400 million birds, poultry birds, live in the country. 
And on the screen here, since in the last six months, since 1st of October 2023, there have been four cases of bird flu in England, two cases in Scotland, and zero in Wales and Northern Ireland. A quite astonishing statistic, and yet they are able to declare an emergency. Of course they are. Now, I went into the scientific side of it. You, you may remember from a previous update that I submitted a freedom of information request in March last year to find out what, apart from the PCR test, which I should remind you is not a diagnostic tool and may not diagnose a condition. It cannot tell you if you are ill or if you're going to be ill or what effect any of that may cause. Nonetheless, the answers to the questions were as such, I, I asked whether they tested the birds' water and feed. The answer was APHA do not carry out tests on water or feed. I asked if they tested the birds' blood to detect any toxicity in the blood. They do not perform toxicity tests on the birds' blood. I also asked about environmental toxicity, and they do not carry out tests on the environment. So in effect, bird flu is, is little more than a concept but it's a very, very useful concept. And indeed, it's one, as I say, that, that is the essentially the, the sort of kernel of a narrative that can be expanded and expanded. And it's exactly what they're doing here. So we see the announcement um, on screen now of bird flu being found in mammals in the sub-Antarctic, which was a couple of months ago. Uh, and on it goes. Now, of course, where's it going? Vaccines. The European Medicines Agency here talking about pandemic influenza. And there's just a few bits I want to draw your attention to here, um, specifically because not only are they using the bird flu, they're talking about strains of bird flu. Again, this is all hypothetical because of the sort of closed loop science behind it. But but the, they're talking about strains of bird flu being used in, in vaccines. Uh, and here we go, the highlighted text that could potentially cause a, a pandemic. They then go on to say that they can be authorised, but not marketed before an influenza pandemic. And this is called, we're talking here specifically about uh, Aflunov, which was a, a medicine that with withdrawn back in 2008. But nonetheless, it's the language that's important. And again, highlighted text, it's intended to protect against a strain of flu that may cause a future pandemic. And I think you can see where this is going. Um, they go on to say that the next flu pandemic could be caused by the H5N1 strain of the virus. Well, lo and behold, that is exactly what they're talking about when they refer to bird flu in this country at the moment. And critically, finally, they say it could be used before or during a flu pandemic. So there's a, there's a lot to, to sort of unpack from that. But I think really the takeaway point, as I said, is, is the absolute lack of trust, the complete abandonment of the democratic process uh, or indeed any heed being paid to the responses from people who've decided that they want to keep poultry for reasons of their own. And this is just, you know, follows the last segment, really. The, the, the level of government interference and arrogance, frankly, is perfectly astonishing. And it, it will be interesting to see what the response to this, the, any action going to be taken by, by the public will be. Yeah, Charles, thank you for that. Um, now, we're going to move on to online safety, and Ofcom has uh, launched a consultation, or at least a call for evidence. Uh, and uh, this is about this is all about the third phase of online safety regulation. So they're seeking evidence to inform our codes of practice and guidance on the additional duties that will apply to some of the most widely used online services uh, and apps uh, designated as categorised services under the Online Safety Act. So they say that uh, under the new laws, all in-scope tech firms must put in place appropriate safety measures to protect users from online harms. In addition, some online services will have to comply with extra requirements if they fall into one of three categories. So I just uh, wanted to highlight this, suggest that people have a look at it uh, and maybe respond if, if they wish. But if we put, put that back on screen for a second, let's just look at the definitions of the category. So category one uh, has two conditions for you to become a category one uh, 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 app or site. Uh, so condition one is that it uses a content recommender system. So that would be the likes of Twitter or Facebook or whatever that has algorithms or YouTube uh, and has more than 34 million UK users on the user to user part of its service, representing around 50% of the UK population. Condition two 
is that it allows users to forward or reshare user-generated content and uses a content recommender system and has more than 7 million UK users uh, in the user-to-user -user part of its service, representing around 10% of its pop uh, UK population. So either of those uh, two uh, conditions is met, then that is a Category 1. This is the first time we've seen these definitions. Uh, category 2A uh, is a s search service. Uh, but not a vertical search service. So in other words, not uh, re restricted to a single topic, but uh, a, you know, basically a search service for everything. So that would be Google or Bing or one of these types of uh, platforms. Uh, has more than 7 million UK users on the search engine part of its service. And category 2B, um, which is a service which uh, meets both of these criteria that allows users to send direct messages and has more than 3 million UK users on the user-to-user -user part of the service, representing five percent of the UK population. So those are the um, service providers that are in scope of this, uh, this call for evidence, um, and uh, basically the main social media companies and search engines. Uh, and so they are looking for feedback from people. That might be something we want to, uh, to get involved with. Uh, Vanessa, let me welcome you back at this point. Uh, and of course, the uh, UN Security Council held uh, a vote on whether there should be a ceasefire in Gaza. Yes, and finally, a successful resolution to adopt a uh, somewhat limited ceasefire. Russia, of course, wanted uh, a total ceasefire that has been consistently vetoed. Um, so let's just watch the, ugh, watch the video of the actual vote. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2024-254 Please they raise their hand. Those against? Abstention. The result of the voting is as follows. 14 votes in favor, zero vote against, one abstention. The draft resolution has been adopted as resolution 2728-2024. Um, quite extraordinary report in CNN yesterday which stated that the US had allowed the ceasefire, which gives some idea of how people perceive um, the, the rule of the UN Security Council with an abstention. Um, now, interesting that, that there was a US abstention, there was a UK vote yes uh, by Ambassador Barbara Woodward, who put out a statement, I think, yesterday, Mike, you sent it yes. to me. Um, and basically, she, she makes very sort of typical comment. She talks about the fact that she would have preferred if they had condemned Hamas for the October 7th attacks. She does talk about the suffering of uh, the Palestinian people, but almost as if it's happening in isolation from Israel and not attributing any of those genocidal uh, campaigns to Israel itself. Um, and I wanted to actually play one video from Inside Gaza that has appeared in the last week. Um, basically, these are Palestinians pushing uh, dead bodies on a cart which is being pulled by a horse. And uh, it is distressing viewing. It's from a distance, but it's still uh, distressing. But let's roll this video. I have to say, Vanessa, that's pretty sick. Too bad about the horse, mm. they said. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So these are the crimes that Barbara Woodward has 
literally never referred to as far as I'm aware. Um, now, I also think that the reason for this abstention and yes vote by the UK are looming elections because they're aware of the damage to um, their election chances um, because of backlash about their support uh, or Biden's and Rishi Sunak's support um, for Israel and its genocidal campaign, obviously genocidal campaign. And what that bombing reminds me of, actually, Mike, is the WikiLeaks footage of the U.S. forces in Iraq, if you remember. Um, and I, I think basically, I mean, Biden has been seeing uh, real pushback in, in swing states like uh, Michigan, Wisconsin. Um, so I think both the U.K. and the U.S. have decided purely on political uh, reasons to make this change in their voting right now. It has nothing to do with protection of Palestinians. And of course, the ceasefire is non-binding. Um, who's going to actually enforce it? But what happened, Netanyahu throws his toys out of the crop, basically, because he perceives the abstention as, as, a, as a betrayal by uh, Washington. And he cancels a major delegation to Washington immediately after the ceasefire vote, which causes some turmoil inside Israel itself. If we look at the next slide, there's um, an IDF, uh, a retired IDF Major General Amos Gilad. What happening is crazy. How did we get to the situation and how did we reach confrontation and friction with the United States? This is an attack on Israeli national security. It's unbelievable. And there have been many such comments. He goes on to say our strategic strength is built on the strength of the army, most of whose weapons come from the United States. A lot of admissions coming through at this point. In short, the alliance with the United States is one of the guarantees of our existence, what, of course, we've all been saying for some time now. And then we, we actually had um, an interview with uh, Israeli media, with former Israeli ambassador to Washington, Dr. Michael Oren. And in it, he actually pointed out that he doesn't believe there is any real pro-Israel candidate uh, in the U.S., neither Trump nor Biden. The Americans believe that this is a war for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and not for the state of Israel. Um, he mentions the operation to enter Rafah. Now, I think many in Israel are terrified of the operation in Rafah because they understand that they've lost control of the IOF forces inside Gaza that are committing atrocities on an almost hourly basis with no control over them whatsoever. And on the next slide, he actually goes on to say, so he claimed the fight with sticks and stones, which of course they can't. He referred to Defense Minister Yoav Gallant's visit, visit to Washington. Um, they will talk about ammunition, and this comes against the backdrop of a global shortage of ammunition due to the war in Ukraine. Another very interesting admission. admission sorry. In the next slide, we'll see who, who Michael Oren uh, was to Syria. So in September 2013, he made very clear that Israel wanted Assad gone since the start of the Syria so-called civil war. What does he go on to say, though? Bad guys backed by Iran are worse for Israel than bad guys who are not supported by the Islamic Republic. Um, he basically says, we prefer al-Qaeda or ISIS to President Assad. And of course, we know that Israel has effectively supported both groups since the beginning of the regime change war, providing weapons, um, hospital treatment, etc. This is particularly ironic in view of the very put out Israeli ambassador's statement, even over the crocus attacks. So let's just roll that. At least 137 people were murdered at Crocus City Concert Hall in Russia on Friday by radical jihadists. And yes, almost six months ago, nearly 400 people were murdered at the Nova Music Festival in Israel by the radical jihadists of Hamas. Why does the Security Council discriminate, discriminate between Russians murdered at a concert and Israelis murdered at a music festival. Civilians, dear colleagues, no matter where they live, deserve to enjoy music in safety and security. And the Security Council should have the moral clarity to condemn such acts of terror equally, 
without discrimination. Perhaps because you supported those terror groups inside Syria? Just a guess. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Charles, let's come back uh, to the UK and uh, food security. Thanks, Mike. Yes, another one that sounds like it might be agriculturally heavy, but, but does concern everybody. Yes, the government have just announced uh, that contrary to their statements back in January, they are in fact going to be limiting the amount of land farmers can take out of productive actions, what they call productive actions, they mean producing food. They say, while there has been only limited evidence to date of farmers entering large amounts of their land into actions that take away food production, some of these actions were being used more than intended in a small number of cases, and so on. They still maintain the line that they can encourage farmers to produce food sustainably alongside improving the environment. So this is rather disingenuous from the start because, of course, there were no limits put in place. They didn't set out an intent and therefore it was perfectly understandable given the nature of farming and the incredible uh, cost of inputs and the uncertainties and especially the uncertainty around subsidy for farmers to choose en masse or rather sort of as a whole for their land to take it out of production and de-risk the entire business by securing guaranteed income. It's hard. It's you know. It's, it's it's very easy to see how that could have happened, or at least how that has happened. Um, now, Defra go on to say exactly what it what it means in future. Uh, under the changes, the sustainable farming incentive applicants will only be able to put twenty five percent of their land into six SFI actions that take land out of direct food production. Well, that's actually a huge change from what they said. First of all, the other thing they're going to be doing is uh, they specifically to protect food security and ensure we continue to produce at least 60% of the food we consume here in the UK to include a new annual UK-wide food security index to capture and present the data needed to monitor levels of food security. So um, this was pointed out to uh, DEFRA back in January um, it seemed clear to UK Column, at least, that this risk lay ahead. And I got in touch with them and I asked them, specifically highlighted there in the red box, what is the minimum permitted area by hectare of the utilised agricultural area? And as a percentage of that, the croppable area, so the, the, the area that's actually using used to produce food, what measures does DEFRA have in place to avoid a significant reduction? DEFRA replied at the time to, to clarify that there was no upper limit on the funding available for any of those schemes. Not all that land is likely to be suitable and so on. So quite clearly, as I said, you know, disingenuous from the start, they didn't qualify that at the, at the outset. Um, and then they went on to say that they do not expect this to change as more farmers sign up to our farming schemes. So DEFRA, in effect, have been massively caught out by this, and um, not least uh, by the, the, the original issue of land going out of food production, but also any kind of plan in place to monitor the situation. And quite clearly, they've been found wanting, which leaves us with the very real question about food security. So Farmers Weekly publishing a headline there saying MPs slammed for dismal turnout at food security debate. It's not quite clear who's actually doing the slamming or what effect that would have had. But I should point out that um, in the three years since uh, March 2020, there have been 31 debates entitled food security, whereas in the previous 10 years, only 21 debates on food security. So that gives a bit of a, a background to the situation as it's felt uh, by Parliament, even if they're not really actually doing anything about it. Um, the debate which did occur last week was led by the Conservative MP Philip Dunn. And I've highlighted some of the text here because I think that it's worth noting. He says, we know all too well that the global food system does not exist in a vacuum. Health crises such as the COVID pandemic or avian flu, geopolitical crises such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine, global supply pinch points such as the blockage in the Suez Canal, can compound the effects of environmental change. And we've seen all those things. The reason I highlight those texts is, is that they are all man-made. They are all absolutely avoidable consequences. And yet he is putting them forward as though they're things that just happen and that they're beyond our control. So now we get into the specifics and we'll look at how much land is in fact uh, under cultivation 
the DEFRA is very slow to produce statistics. So these go back to 2022. We can be sure, given what's happened uh, just yesterday, that the crop of malaria is less than this. But they say it's 6.1 million hectares. And I thought, since we're continually told that everything we do is sort of, in effect, a response to the situation in Russia or, or, or uh, in some ways that Russia should be demonised and, and, and so forth, I found a government meeting took place on 21st of March and the spring planting was, was discussed at this meeting. Text from that shows that their cropland will hit 85, uh, sorry, 84.5 million hectares through this year, which has gone up by 300,000 hectares as opposed to down like it has in the United Kingdom. And also at the bottom there, I, I highlight that 8 million hectares are under perennial grasses. That means despite the push in the United Kingdom for net zero, eat bugs, stay off meat, they have more land being grazed by livestock than we do as a total measure of our agricultural area. You might say, well, Russia is an absolutely enormous landmass with a larger population, which it is. So I will contextualise that by showing these figures here, which give the respective cropable areas, which are UK 6.1 million, Russia 84.5, population ours is 67 million, Russian 145. Now that works out as meaning that we have 0.091 hectares in cultivation per person, whereas Russia has 0.587 hectares of, of agricultural land in production. Okay, again, not going to be a like-for-like -like comparison, but it is worth noting that Russia uses six point, nearly six and a half times as much land per head for food production. Now, my bet would be that food security in Russia might be less of an issue than it is in the United Kingdom. So the question that drops out of this is, what do DEFRA do all day? And also, why is it that we still have schemes going forward to use land for things like solar panels and battery installations? Yes, very good questions. And uh, we will talk more about that and extra as well. Vanessa, let's just uh, finish uh, in Syria. And uh, what's the United States been up to? Well, yeah, just very quickly, um, almost immediately after the uh, Moscow attack, only a few days, I think, uh, dawn yesterday, US and Israel, um, that's been also confirmed to me by resistance factions here inside Syria, carried out an attack with more than 60 missiles from the Al Tanif US illegal military base on the border with Jordan, the Red Circle, in the Triangle area in the northeast. Uh, hitting Derizor City and uh, areas that were um, really bases for the Syrian National Defense Forces, the Islamic uh, Resistance Iraq, some uh, IRGC, the Iranian forces that are there basically securing safety for civilians and also, of course, fighting ISIS that the US is, is using and maneuvering as a proxy. So I just have a very quick video, the only one that I could find that wasn't terribly shaky of at least a couple of the missiles falling um, in that Derizor area. Um, and the statement from the Syrian Ministry of Defense, uh, the US occupation forces, they didn't mention Israel for some reason, but that has been confirmed launched an air aggression with military aircraft and drones, targeting a number of towns, villages, and military sites in Deir ez-Zor. It resulted in the martyrdom of seven military personnel, one civilian, the injury of 19 military personnel, and 13 civilians, which included women and children, and significant material losses to public and private property. Of course, this is illegal. Also, what we've seen is an uptick in aggression from uh, the Idlib uh, al-Qaeda forces and affiliates against Western Aleppo and against Northern Latakia, and an uptick in ISIS attacks against Syrian Arab army positions and civilians in central Syria, emanating also from al tanif Yes. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you very much for that. We're going to end there for today. I'm going to say thank you to Vanessa and Charles, uh, and thank you to everybody that's been watching. Uh, we will be back in a few minutes for some extra if you're a UK column member. But uh, either way, uh, if you join us at 1 p.m. tomorrow for the next uh, edition of No Smoke Without Fire with Brian and Debbie, uh, reminder, we're not doing a news program on Friday or Monday, so we will see you next week. I hope everybody has a great Easter. Uh, and uh, we'll see you then. Bye-bye.